today as we come to the table. You really think that I'm not control? You think that you can change things and alter the climate of the earth? You like worshiping the sun so much? You talk about it getting hot? I'll get it hot for you. The angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. So the sun, there's going to be global warming. It's going to happen. But it's not because of our cars, especially not because of Harleys. They're completely environment, environmental friendly. But because man worships it so much, God says, I'm going to show you who's in control. I'm in control. You're not. Have you ever thought you were in control of something only to find out it was only an illusion? Maybe you had a job where you thought you had the power to make decisions or changes, but as soon as a big decision needed to be made, someone came in and overturned everything you had tried to do. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark reminds you that no matter how much you think you can change, God is the only one who's ultimately in control. People try so hard to change the environment or the climate, so much that they start to worship it. Those people will eventually learn who is really in control. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Revelation chapter 16 with today's edition of Come to the Table. Now let's get into chapter 16. We come to the seven bowls. Um, this takes place, the final three and a half years are what we know of as the Great Tribulation. Now, a lot of people think the Great Tribulation is the last seven years. It's not. The last seven years is when God promises to deal with the nation of Israel. He owes them seven prophetic years, Daniel chapter 9. So he owes them seven prophetic years that are going to kick in at some point and start, out, start going but at the midway point of that, that final three and a half years before the second coming will be what we know of as the Great Tribulation Period. During the Great Tribulation Period, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls will all be poured out. Uh, the seals could be opened. You could see some of that beginning uh, and some of the bleed over of these uh, first two happening in the first three and a half. That could be a theological argument. But it's pretty clear that these bowls here that are going to be poured out, the final plagues of God on the earth are going to be poured out that final three and a half. This is what we call the wrath of God. And this is why I feel confident we will not be here. Why? Because again, we suffer the wrath of man. We suffer the wrath of Satan. But the Bible says we will never suffer the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For you, Christian, have not been appointed to the wrath of God. That's what it says. All right? My own words. But now we get into this, and we're really coming to kind of like a repeat of, of Egypt and the ten plagues. You know, the ten plagues of Egypt, it's interesting. God attacked, when he poured out the ten plagues of Egypt, he was attacking the gods of Egypt. And now we see him in the seven last bowls of wrath in the last days, we're going to see him attacking the gods of our day as well. God's consistent. He showed that the gods of Egypt were not gods and he was God back in that day. Now he's going to show that the gods of the earth are not gods and he is God in the very last day. Now why do we have ten plagues in Egypt and only seven here? Because ten is the number of testing in Scripture, testing and trial. And God was testing and trying the nation of Egypt and really giving a picture to the world that you still can come to Christ. You still have that opportunity and it's, it's, it's kind of this trying to break them, if you will. This is now... Seven, because seven being the number of completion, God is saying, this is it. You either get saved during this time and, or there's no other opportunities. Because when I come back in the second coming, there is no opportunity to be saved once the second coming takes place. Now, people can still be saved during these bowls that are poured out. But these seven bowls are the completed wrath of God. And that's why we see a different number here. But it's interesting. We're going to see God dealing with the gods of this world in the same way that he dealt with the gods of Egypt's day with the nation of Israel. Verse 
1, chapter 16, John, Then I heard a loud voice from the, tr uh, the temple saying to the seven angels, these are those that are going to pour out these bowls of wrath, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So God now gives the command. First bowl. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. It's interesting, foul means running and oozing. So this is going to be a running and oozing, loathsome means painful, a running, oozing, painful sore came upon those, notice, who had taken the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. God says, if you're going to worship a false god, if you're going to worship the Antichrist, I'm going to judge you for doing that. And now God pours out his judgment on that false worship, and it comes to a foul and loathsome sore. And again, all kinds of imagery there. Um, you know, and really kind of, you know, when you serve Satan, that's kind of what happens. Foul and loathsome sores. It's interesting, when you look at what goes on in the club scene, and all the people sleeping around, and all these different things, it's all the diseases, and all the sores, and all the loathsome things that happen um, in the midst of that, even some deadly, like AIDS, et cetera, that take place in this, this atmosphere. And so God says, look, you want to worship uh, the, the enemy, you want to worship Satan, then you're going to get what comes with that. And that judgment, again, here is foul and loathsome sores for those who take the mark of the beast and who worship his image. That's the judgment in the first bowl. So basically, worshiping false gods is now judged, or really worshiping a man who is calling himself God now receives that judgment, a God of the earth at that time, because he'll be claiming his God. Notice the second bowl. It says, the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Now, in some of the earlier judgments, you saw certain creatures dying. Listen to what happens the final three and a half years. Every living creature in the sea died. What is one of the things that mankind worships today? The sea and the things in it. Whales, dolphins, nature. God is now going to say you're worshiping nature. You're worshiping the environment. I will now destroy it. Because I will show you that I am God, and I alone am to be worshipped. Nature is not to be worshipped. The climate is not to be worshipped. I am to be worshipped. And the consequence on this particular judgment of this God, that is nature worship or worshipping the environment, is really rather drastic. As a matter of fact, it says that, uh, that it became as blood of a dead man. No, again, became blood as of a dead man. Some would say, well, it's not literal blood. It was just something that was very polluted. Uh, it says it was blood. Uh, my understanding is that seawater is not very far chemically from real blood with small changes. And certainly God is more than able to make blood out of this if he wants. Maybe the blood of all the animals that have been destroyed and die in the ocean when this happens. But what's really grotesque about this is those who say the consistency of blood compared to water is much thicker. And that it would probably cause the oceans of the world to rise about 50 feet. Now imagine if the oceans of the world rose because of the thickness of the water by about 50 feet. Think what would happen to all the coastal cities. Think of New York, Florida, California, Hong Kong, Japan. Just go to all the coasts around the earth and think what would happen if the waters came up 50 feet higher. Think of the cities that would be covered with the ocean. Now think of the cities that would be covered with the blood of the ocean. Floating turtles and dolphins and whales and fish and all these nasty, bloody creatures and the stench filling the cities up. And he says, you love the environment so much that you'll ignore me and put it above me. Have your fill. And so God judges it. He deals with it. Comes the third one. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water. And they became his blood. This is now man's drinking source. So now the drinking sources of the earth become blood. And this is, this is such an amazingly righteous judgment. This is, I would call it almost perfect justice. Listen to what it says. 
And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For you have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. They worshipped their false gods, and in the worship of their false gods, they put to death the believers, the ones who wouldn't worship the Antichrist, the ones who wouldn't worship Allah, go down the list. And God turns the waters to blood and said, you love blood so much, you really like this? Drink it. Wow. I mean, I can't think of a more just judgment. You know, when I read this, I thought about all those uh, Muslims lining those Christians up and cutting their heads off there at the ocean in, 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 in Tripoli. If you remember seeing that on the news and they cut their heads off and this whole thing and they made the big scene to go by the ocean and they did it again later on and cut another group of heads off. I thought, how interesting here. We see them worshiping their false God and cutting off the heads of the children of God next to the ocean and God's going to one day turn the ocean to blood. You like blood so much next to the ocean. You really like that. I'm going to let you drink it. You're going to get to drink blood. Wow. Now remember, this sounds radical, but again, you're talking about those that have, at this point in Revelation, the angels of God have flown around the earth and warned everyone, and they said, we don't want God, we don't want your message, forget it. We want to worship a man, and we want to worship nature. Leave us alone. And we want to kill the Christians. He says, you want that so much? Here's all your gods. I'm going to judge them one by one. Enjoy that. So realize what's happening here. This is not somebody's grandmother who just made the apple pie. We're talking about rebellious mankind in the final three and a half years who are shaking their fist at God, even with angels circling the earth, warning them, saying, we, we want nothing to do with your God or your heaven or your Jesus. We want nothing to do with you. And this is who God's dealing with. I heard another angel from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Again, over and over and over those in heaven proclaim that God's judgments are right and they are true. Now we come to the next one. This one also deals with the worship of the environment and all the climate change stuff and all that. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. <laughs> you really think you control the temperature of the sun? You really think that I'm not controlling? You think that you can change things and alter the climate of the earth? You like worshiping the sun so much, you talk about it getting hot, I'll get it hot for you. The angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. So the sun, there's going to be global warming. It's going to happen. But it's not because of our cars, especially not because of Harleys. They're completely environment, environmental friendly. But because man worships it so much, God says, I'm going to show you who's in control. I'm in control. You're not. We have, we have no power whatsoever to control these things. Again, it's like the fish in the aquarium, you know, changing the environment. It's, it's up to the person who runs the aquarium to make sure the environment's good. That doesn't mean we're, and I, we can get to the argument. Look, I understand. That doesn't mean we're just throw trash out the window. And we're, I'm not saying that. It's, God owns this. We should take care of it. And if I borrow something from you guys, I take care of it. How much more what God owns? So that's not my point. I'm just saying when it goes to the extreme where men begin to worship it. As it says in Romans chapter 1, they stopped worshiping the creator and started worshiping the creature. So God says, all right, you want to worship global warming? Here's what happens to your God. He's going to scorch you. And men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues. See, God's the one who has the power, not man. And they did not repent and give him glory. Still not repenting. And by the way, notice, these are all acts of love. These are acts of love. Now, Mark, how can you say this is an act of love? When you have someone that is so bent on going to hell and they want nothing to do with God, the greatest loving thing you can do is make their life so miserable that they'll eventually break. And all God is doing in these plagues, he's trying to break them and get them to finally repent so they'll give their life to God. So it's an act of love, although it's tough love, quite obviously. Now he comes to the fifth bowl, and now we see him judging what men love. Men love darkness rather than light. So he says, you love darkness, I'll give you darkness. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Now we don't know where that is. Where is Satan's throne? I don't know. 
I think it's probably when you look at the world, if you step back and just look at the world, where's all the ugliest things happen? I would say he's thrown somewhere in the Middle East. That'd be my guess. Because that's where some of the ugliest things in the world take place. And no doubt right around Satan is going to be the greatest influence of the ugliest things on the planet. So whether it's there, we don't know. Whether it shifts, we don't know. But he pours out whatever, wherever it is, he pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast, the Antichrist, and his kingdom, and he became full of darkness. Okay, you love darkness? Have your fill of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. So still not repenting. See, notice God keeps mentioning they're not repenting. Why? Because that's the goal. Repent. If you repent, you're going to be freed from this. If you don't, it's just going to get worse. Now he pours out the sixth bowl, and notice he says, And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. By the way, the Euphrates, of course, is, on the, is in between Iran and Israel. Iran kind of overlaps back and forth, and Iraq overlaps, so Iraq and Iran. So it's dried up so they can move as they come down to Armageddon, which, by the way, Armageddon is a different battle than Ezekiel 38 and 39. We're looking right now for Ezekiel 38 and 39. Armageddon is the one it's talking about here, different battle. This is the battle at the very end. And I saw three unclean spirits, again, this whole picture of the unholy trinity, and they were like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. So Satan, again, releasing these three demons, these unclean spirits, to gather the, the armies of the world against Israel again this final time. And they came out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. So out of this, the, again, these demons coming out as Satan is moving them. And again, three, it's interesting to me, the three demons and the three, and dragon and the beast and the false prophet. Again, this whole picture of the unholy trinity uh, fighting against God. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs. Again, remember, we're going to see miracles in the last days by the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're going to have power to do miracles. We talked about this before, how miracles do not necessarily mean that Somebody's godly. Just because they can do a miracle, a lot of times it's demonic. And here it will be. And they go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And now all of a sudden, right in the middle of all this, it's like God's laying all this heavy, thick judgment on and telling us what's going to be happening in all these bowls. And it's like, it's like heavy duty. And all of a sudden he throws in this refreshing verse. It's almost like a cup of cold water in the midst of all this incredible judgment and he gives a reminder to us and to everyone reading this. Like, you don't want to be a part of this? I'm giving you a way out. Look at verse 15. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and who keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. In other words, be ready. Be watching. Again, the garments here, it's interesting. If you, if you were to fall asleep on your watch, they would come and oftentimes steal your garments. And in some cases, even set them on fire. Now, it's interesting about the Romans. The Romans would have like groupings of 16 soldiers together in these special forces. And if any one of the 16 fell asleep on their job, then the emperor would kill all of them. You think there'd be any pressure on your buddies to stay awake at their post? And what they would do historically, they would say, if, if they found they would wear those Roman kind of skirt things or whatever, if they found one of their buddies asleep because it meant the other 15 could be put to death if he was caught, they would, they would set his skirt on fire, literally. He'd take a coal and put it on it while he's sleeping and let it catch on fire. He'd wake up with it burning. And it depends on how long it took him to wake up, how much damage it did, and how naked he was. But when that happened, it was kind of like, okay, I'm not going to be falling asleep again because my buddies are literally going to set my pants on fire. <laughs> but some of the more gracious would just take your garments that you laid aside and walk off with them. So you'd wake up and you wouldn't have your garment. If it was cold, you wouldn't have your robe or whatever. And it's just kind of it's gone. It's like you learned a lesson. Don't fall asleep. And he says, here, hey, you need to be watching. You need to be keeping your spiritual garments on lest you walk naked and they see your shame. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people who say that the rapture is not going to happen. The Bible over and over and Jesus over and over says, be watching, be watching, be watching. If the rapture wasn't going to take place, there'd be nothing to be watching for, by the way. Because the only thing we would be watching for would be the second coming. That's not going to come as a thief. We're going to know when that's coming. We're going to have, if we're here, you can actually count the days down. The Bible tells us when the Antichrist, when this world leaders, the instead of Christ, which is what anti means, when the instead of Christ signs that treaty with the nation of Israel and he's a world leader, there's going to be exactly 2,520 days until the second coming. Daniel tells us that. 
No guesswork. It gives a specific day. So that means when Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour, he's got to be talking about something other than the second coming. It also means the Lord, when he says be watching, he's not talking about the second coming because we don't need to watch. You just kind of count the days down when that happens and we'd be ready. No, there's going to be an event that takes place where the Lord's going to grab his bride out of here and it's going to catch us by surprise. He said, don't you be caught by surprise. Be ready. Be watching. And so he gives that encouragement right here in the midst of it. And it says, and they gathered them together to the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. And that is, of course, in Megiddo, Armageddon, up in the northern part of Israel, an amazing battlefield. So um, the sixth bowl is poured out. Now we come to the seventh bowl, and notice that God's going to just completely, radically change the earth and shake the earth. And again, this is going to kind of do away with any earth worship or looking toward the earth, because it's going to be completely shaken and reformed and reshaped by the Lord himself in this. It says, in the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. It's almost like this, you know, wipe it out type thing. It's from the, it's an aerial. It's not just something of the earth. It's this whole atmosphere on the earth now, the entire earth being judged in one fell swoop, so to speak. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. It'll be the biggest earthquake in world history. Imagine that. You'll see why. Listen what it does. And the great city Again, I believe no doubt here talking about Jerusalem, something that may be Babylon, but I believe Jerusalem. But uh, it says, A great city was broken into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. You know, it's interesting, the Bible says that when the Lord comes back, there's going to be a great shaking of the earth and the whole topography of the earth. That is, the layout of the earth is going to change. All the mountains will be thrown down, and, and it says that Jerusalem will be raised up as the highest mountain on the planet. It'll be the new Mount Everest, except it's not going to be as tall as Mount Everest. Everything else will be laid flat. All the mountains will be flat. So you'll just have a flat globe as the Lord comes back to restore it. There'll be one mountain. It'll be Jerusalem. And on there, there'll be a great big plateau where the Lord's throne is. Those who have done the calculations say it's going to be about 26 miles by 26 miles or so in size. I haven't done that, so don't quote me on that. But for those who have, they say it's going to be a platform about like that. Which, by the way, it says that when the Lord gathers the sheep and the goats before his throne, now you see how the nations of the earth could be gathered on that spot. You think, wow, you couldn't get all the nations of the earth on that spot. According to statisticians, you can get every person on the planet in Texas. So if you can gather every person on the planet within the state of Texas, if they just all stood side by side, certainly you can get the people of the earth that are left on this area that's going to be judged uh, when God raises up Jerusalem. So it may be Jerusalem, it may be uh, Babylon. We know that's going to happen in Jerusalem, but either way it says here, this great city will be broken into three parts. The cities of the nations will fall. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, Babylon really is a picture of everything that's been wrong since the earth was reestablished after the flood. And just like that, another episode of Come to the Table is coming to an end. Speaking of endings, we're in the final book of the Bible, Revelation. The events mentioned in this book can be somewhat frightening for those who don't know God. But for those who have put their trust in Him, there's much to look forward to. The end of Revelation brings so much hope and joy as God makes things right and ushers in a time with Him that will have no ending. It's hard to imagine, right? Sometimes our finite minds just can't fathom what eternity will be like with Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for what he has in store. If you're interested in getting to know us in person, you can come be part of what's going on at Calvary Knoxville in Knoxville, Tennessee. For over 20 years, it's been incredible to see how God has used this community of believers in our community and through his radio outreach. Keep in mind that there's always a seat for you. Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11.15 a.m., Saturday night at 6 p.m., or Wednesday night at 7 p.m. If you can't make it in person, that's okay. Join us online. We stream our services through the Way Media app that you can download from your app store or right from the waymedia.net. Just scroll to the bottom of the waymedia.net for a link to our church info too. As we come to a close today, know that we care about you. We pray for you. 
And we look forward to you joining us for another edition here. May the things that you've been learning in the book of Revelation really stick with you, connecting you to the one who holds everything in the palm of his hand. This has been Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.